a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died because the water was bitter. Wormwood. 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 Well, welcome everybody. We uh, appreciate all of you that have come from a long distance and uh, we're only here for about an hour, hour and a half maybe, but uh, it's really an awesome thing to see all of you all here. Anyway, today we're going to start off with uh, our usual and we're going to use the model prayer and hopefully it won't be so repetitious, but uh, Rabbi Yehusha was uh, asked how he was asked to, for the disciples from the disciples to teach them how to pray and there's two elements in well there's a lot of elements in this prayer that he gave us and we can use this model prayer to bring out different aspects like for example it's it's about us not just an individual but we collectively are praying and asking him for things but there's two elements in there that that pop out too and it's about his name and his will. His will be done on earth. Well, his will, of course, we know is his covenant, his Ten Commandments, which he gave Israel. And his will is for us as well, because he does not change. Malachi uh, records his words. He says, I am Yahuwah, and I do not change. But we have been infected with teachings of error that say no he does change he's changing his will all the time and the sabbath is now the first day of the week uh, well you know all these little subtle things that happen uh, are religions you know and those religions are the wormwood I and mean, that's the topic of today the wormwood that we're going to study that has infected the the people of earth anyway the the prayer that he gave them with some of the restored authentic hebrew words will be placed in there and it starts out like this our Abba who is in Shamayim Kodesh be your name your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in Shamayim give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the honor forever and ever. Amen. So we have those two key elements there at the beginning of the prayer. Your name is set apart. Your name. And your will. See, there's two things right there hanging right in the beginning of the prayer. So we need to remember that those that don't listen to our words are not repenting because we have to repent of our sins and come to a knowledge of the truth of why we're sinners you know be convicted of sin by knowing his commandments and then understanding that his name is part of that com uh, those commandments because he's even got a commandment about his name we're going to look at that in just a moment those that may be watching this can read this chart and see the terms we're going to use today the traditional terms are going to be replaced with the authentic Hebrew words, like we restored some of those in the prayer. Now, the, 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 uh, the, the name Lord isn't a, isn't a name. We're going to replace it with the, the actual name used in Scripture, Yahuwah. And that's a four-lettered word. And um, we're going to call the, the, the Savior, the Deliverer, by his real actual name, Yahusha or Yahushua. Uh, the prophet Yesha Yahu has that same component in his name. They call him Isaiah. Anyway, the Sha is an abbreviation of the word for the word deliverance. It comes from the root Yasha. Anyway, there's the other words. We don't use the word G-O-D because we uh, understand that to be the actual proper name of a solar deity of the Teutonic tribes. But we're going to use El or Elohim. 
And of course, uh, we're called Nazarene. Uh, in Acts 24, verse 5, we learn that, you know, we were actually called Nazarene. That's 24, verse 5 of Acts. Because we're, uh, Shaul was accused of being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. So, anyway, let's move along and uh, see what we can find out. Regarding the name in the Torah, that's in the prayer. His name is set apart, and his will being done on earth is his Torah, because he doesn't change. And here's the name written for you in modern Hebrew and in ancient Hebrew, and that would be the four letters yod He ua He. The W is often used in that third letter right there, because, uh, but it's a W. Okay, and that's a new letter, 13th century. And it's uh, from Luke 11, it says, Kodesh be your name, your will be done on earth. Now the living words, we're going to start off with those as we usually do, because he wants us to think of these when we rise up and when we lie down and go in and out. So a lot of you may not have been exposed to those. But Psalm 37 actually mentions uh, this attitude, turn away from evil and do good and dwell forever. For Yahuwah does right ruling and does not forsake his kind ones, his chosen ones. They shall be guarded forever, but the seed of the wrongdoers is cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. We're not going to be uh, floating around on clouds and harps. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of right ruling. And the Torah of his Elohim is in his heart. So, and his steps do not slide. So we're like little arcs of the covenant where he's put his law, his Torah, his teachings in our hearts. He inscribed them as the mediator of the covenant. Now in Deuteronomy 5, we have here the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes in the last days. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my command, commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now, some of you that are new see the word cast, and that means to throw. That's the Hebrew word nasa. And that means to uh, cast or to take, but most, most often it's to, to cast or throw, uh, to use it. You know, and if you take it to ruin, the word ruin in that text in two places is the word Shoah, which you remember Yom HaShoah is the day of the Holocaust, to utterly lay waste his name. Now, if you don't use his name, you have laid it waste. Number four, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm, Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. It's a covenant sign. It's the sign of the everlasting covenant. And it's going to be here forever because it's everlasting. And if the, if the covenant is everlasting, then the sign of the covenant is also everlasting. And that can be looked at in several places, one of which is Ezekiel 20, or Yehezkel 20. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you. 
Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, the Catholic uh, organization wiped out, wiped out the second commandment about bowing to idols and replaced, just wiped it out so that they could have their statues. And they took and made the Tenth Commandment into two commandments so that they retained ten. Just, for, just so you know. Now, hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one, and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, the ones that we just read, which, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them on your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. They'll be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And that is all one whole section of text for the lost tribes. Uh, Psalm 138 is worth noting too. I bow myself towards your set-apart temple and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great above all your word and your name. And that's talking about his covenant. His word is his Ten Commandments. And the identification of wormwood, we've heard this word wormwood just in passing, and we'll open, it, it'll open many eyes to a reality that's around us. And it's both physical and it's spiritual. So wormwood needs to be cleaned out of the temple. Where is the temple? Well, he has made us his temple if he indwells us. So when we're immersed, we join a congregation or the commonwealth of Israel is what we're really doing. We're not joining a denomination or becoming a Christian or any of that. We're joining to the covenant. We promise to obey the covenant. And that was something else that happened at Sinai that those that were present as well as those that were not present were in joining to that covenant. Now, wormwood has to be identified, and it's uh, easily done if you have spiritual discernment. Now, the, one of the things that if you, there's a physical wormwood and then there's a spiritual wormwood. Uh, we see this root here, and that's uh, known by a common term. It's mandrake or mugwort. In the Hebrew, it's called dudai, and in Greek, it's absinthos. It's uh, known by different names. But what it is, is it's a hallucinogenic. And Reuben, who was probably the first drug pusher, found some. <laughs> uh, Reuben was the son of Leah, the firstborn of the tribes of Israel. And he was out during the wheat harvest, if you read Genesis or Bereshith chapter 30. And he drug back this giant load of these hallucinogenic drugs and gave them to his mother Leah. But uh, because it was an aphrodisiac. And... Uh, Anyway, that's a, that's a translation. Love apples, that's very good. They were also known as love apples, but they're just roots, and they, uh, you know, would use them for their, uh, they would, apparently Reuben was a, was a party animal, because he was, you know, caught with one of uh, his father's concubines, probably with the mandrakes. Yes, sir? Yes, uh, it's Dudai. Dudai is the name of the thing that's actually in the Hebrew. That's what it's called. It's Genesis 30. And when you see the translation in, I think, the scriptures, you'll see it written as love apples. Yeah. Anyway, it's a poison. It's a member of the nightshade family. <laughs> it's associated with venom, gall. But the primary thing I want you to remember is the bitterness. The bitterness that this stuff generates. And it, and, it, and, it, and it causes misery, and it brings affliction and a curse. Not the plant so much, but it would. I mean, if your body ingested this stuff improperly too much, it would be a curse and it would be an affliction. But uh, here's the thing I want you to understand is that uh, there's two levels that we have to look at Hebrew on. 
you've got Hebrew words that have a concrete and an abstract meaning. So one is literal and the other meaning is figurative, okay? So one's a solid and the other one is just an idea, okay? So we have a concrete physical wormwood and we've got abstract or spiritual wormwood to consider. They're intangible, you can't touch them. They're ideas, okay? Now, lies will bring bitterness. I don't know if you all realize it, but when you're lied to, you, you have a bitter feeling in your heart, you know. And the same thing happens to the person that's lying. They feel bitter because they've been caught in the lie. You know, there's a horrible feeling. It's a terrible thing. But uh, the concrete thing is an object. It's actually uh, available to your senses. Now, so Hebrew words have to be comprehended, not just in the day they were, you know, but you have to understand what the real meaning is. Now, um, there's a star, mentioned in, a star mentioned in Revelation called Wormwood, but it isn't really the word Wormwood. It's actually, in the Greek, is all we have. It's this word um, absinthos, you know. That's what it's called in the, in, the, in the Greek translation. In Revelation 8, it says, And the third messenger, that's a trumpet sounding, and a, uh, sounded, and a great star fell from the heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of water. And the name of the star is called Absinthos, or Wormwood, Mugwort, you know. And a third of the rivers became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Notice that word bitter is, is used. Now it's a figurative abstract meaning and it could be a physical thing too. So we, we have to look at this stuff as watchmen or Nazarene and say that it could be a physical event. Something could actually happen that poisons the waters. Something like a star. Yes? Japan has a lawsuit against Russia right now because when Chernobyl blew, it poisoned roughly a third of the fish in the Sea of Japan. Isn't that interesting? Well, when Chernobyl blew, it actually polluted almost a dozen countries, yeah. not just Japan, but many. Of yeah. Chernobyl, it's amazing, yeah. We're going to bring that up uh, in just a little bit, and we're going to see that very clearly, but I'm, I'm glad that you know that. That's really great. Anyway, I was going to ask you how much Ukrainian you, you, you all spoke here. That's a Ukrainian word, Chernobyl. Anyway, uh, they, were, they were made bitter. And it says in Amos 5, 7, O you, were turning, o you who are turning right ruling into wormwood. Okay, in other words, you're taking the commandments, the teachings of Yahuwah, and turning them into wormwood. Now that's what we're perceiving today now. He's waking us up. Now, and you have cast down righteousness to the earth. So they're trampling the, to the covenant under their feet and saying, oh, well, we're above that or that was for them and we're somebody else and he, he's forsaken those people and we're the new people you know whatever but um, that's kind of creepy you know when you think about wormwood is actually something Yahuwah says is turning right ruling into wormwood you know Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah 9 says and Yahuwah says because they have forsaken my Torah which I have set before them and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but they have walked according to the stubbornness of their own heart, and after the B-A-A-L-I-M, that's the plural, which their fathers had taught them. Therefore, thus said Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, <coughs> See, I am making this people eat wormwood, and I shall make them drink poisoned water. Yes, it is. He ground it up and made them drink it, you know. And I shall scatter them among the Gentiles whom neither they nor their fathers have known. <coughs> Excuse me. And I shall send a sword after them until I have consumed them. So here's a little boy that's being checked for radiation here too, you know. The Hebrew language and expression of thought involves literal and figurative. Considering Psalms 
or Tehillim chapter 1, He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Well, look at the concrete words and how they're expressed as abstract thoughts. The tree would be planted by streams of water. Well, the tree is upright or a righteous person. The streams of water would have to be the living words, the living, well, the living water is the, is the Torah. That's the streams of water, the words of Torah. The fruit would be the good character and behavior that comes from that, you know. And the unwithered leaf in this expression would have to be prosperity. So you're going to prosper. Now, um, I don't think that we have to concern ourselves with this donkey down here, but it's interesting. Uh, it will relate in your mind somewhere, but these donkeys... Uh, the word hamar in Arabic is a derogatory term that refers to someone of very limited intelligence, but in the Hebrew, the word is related to the, to the Arabic word because the Arabic word gets it from the Hebrew. It's hamur, and it means uh, something very special because the donkey is a respected animal in the Hebrew culture, but not respected in the Arabic culture. But uh, so we can have words that are literal, but, and they can come, up, come across with different abstractions. So if a, if a word in Hebrew means something good, in other languages it can mean something not good. And that's what I'm putting that in there for. Um, anyway, so we can think of our, our own bodies on a, on a physical level like we would a computer housing with all of its physical parts, the hardware. The hardware of the computer could be called the temple, you know, the, uh, the, the physical object. But the secondary spiritual content could be the programs, the software. So the living purpose of this temple is the operating system. The operating system can't be touched with your hands. It's something that's, that's moving in some other realm than a physical realm. It's an it's a, it's a ever-changing thing. So the tangible, physical temple of, uh, in a computer is, is able to be touched, but it's not, it doesn't really have behavior until you instill programming into it. Now, our programming should be based upon the Torah, the will of Yahuwah, and those are ideas. The false reasoning produces faulty outward behavior, and it, the physical temple is subject to deterioration and rust and damage from physical wormwood. Physical wormwood could be rust, or it could be uh, anything, water, you know, uh, anything that damages the temple. Now, false teachings are kind of like viruses because they, be, they, they, took, they take Yahuwah's teachings and they change them and they turn them to wormwood, see? So the wormwood is going to affect both the physical and the spiritual aspects of this. So poisonous teachings is the bad programming. And we have been instilled with all sorts of bad programming. Now if we have a virus or a spiritual wormwood living in us, that affects our programming and we need to cleanse ourselves from such programming by renewing our minds. So we have Rabbi Yahusha to guide us into the truth and he'll reveal it to us. And then in Romans 11, Shaul writes these words. Oh, the depth of riches and wisdom and knowledge of Elohim. How unsearchable are his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of Yahuwah? Or who has become his counselor? Or who, or who first gave to him and it shall be given back to him? Because of him and through him and to him are all. To whom be esteemed forever. Amen. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. So we can prove that his perfect desire is that we walk in his covenant. You know, Now I look at a concrete version of uh, Wormwood would be the tangible, the things that we can see and, and smell and hear and touch with our senses. And that kind of wormwood has been unleashed on the earth 
now. Uh, the oil was hitting us last year in, in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was going into the waters. And it just went on for months and months. And now, this new thing that's happened in Japan, they're saying that's going to take months and months and months, and it's just pouring into the oceans, you know, and the air. But uh, the atomic nuclei found in stars is the activity that's going on in these nuclear facilities. So the star called Wormwood, or the, it's like that, because the energy of stars is what we have going on there, and it's going into the waters. Revelation 8.10 starts out and says, And the third messenger sounded, and a great star, or that like a great star, fell from the heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of water, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became worm Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. So the oceans are going to cause, well, at Chernobyl, there was a lot of, radiation, and still is there, it's caused uh, deformations and animals and people, you know, and deaths, and uh, it's polluted rivers. They've dammed up the river there that was near the, the site. But uh, bitter would have to include radiation, you know, or radioactive pollution. <clears throat> the word wormwood and the lost city of Chernobyl, it's an abandoned city. There were over 100,000 people there. There were huge structures that were there. They had this site without a containment center over, around it at all. And they had this facility right in the middle of the city. <laughs> and they were just running a little simple test, and it was a safety check. They were seeing if they could keep the generators going with the momentum from the engine that they were, the, the generator, and uh, you know, or the actual thing that was generating electricity. They thought they could get it to, if it ever lost power, that they could start their backup generations, generators with some of that same rotational energy. And in the midst of their test, the thing failed. It failed to start the generators. And then the thing overheated, because they were in shutdown mode, you know. So anyway, we have that literal and we have that physical. And those who debate the meaning of Mormwood overlook the figurative. There, people say, oh, it doesn't mean that at all. But, but they're only looking at the physical. See, they don't understand the abstract meaning. That the city is named after the Ukrainian word for mugwort or wormwood, like David said. It's, uh, I don't want to pronounce this first word, it's A-R-T-E-M-I-S-I-A. -I -I and some of you understand why you can't say that word. Vulgaris, which is Chernobyl. The etymology is a combination of the words chernoi, which means black, and Belia, which means grass blades or stalks, hence it would literally mean black grass or black stalks. That's the literal meaning. But the abstract meaning is what we're really talking about. That may signify burnt grass, perhaps prior to cultivation, but, you know, there's a picture of the site right there. Now, the wormwood, the word itself, etymologically, means bitters. <clears throat> now, uh, over on the right, you're going to see something, a big bottle of wine. It's a type of wine. It's made from grapes. And we call it vermouth. Okay, vermouth. You have probably heard of vermouth. Uh, most of the time, people don't know what they're drinking, but it's something that's derived from grapes. And it's in a wine bottle. Anyway, um, the etymology of the Old English ver wormwood, or wormod, wormwood, is cognate, or derived from the same source as vermouth. And the Dutch is Wermoet, and Old High German is Were Mauta, or Moeta. And the German word today is Vermut. They pronounce their W's as a V. The, and because the word, the letters W and V both come from the letter U, actually. Anyway, the literal use or suggested where man plus mod courage from its early use as an aphrodisiac. The Hebrew is dudae or dudai, and it's mentioned in Genesis 30, as we mentioned. It's, you know, the plant today called mandrake or love apples. And the figurative use refers to its bitter aftertaste. In folk etymology, it was used to protect clothes and bedding from moths and fleas. But the Greek word absinthos is mentioned in the star, 
that fell from the heavens. Revelation 8, verse 11. So the wormwood abstract meaning, absinthos, the bitterness which results from lies. So if we look at what scripture is talking about relative to wormwood, we see very clearly Yahuwah himself, through the prophet Amos, said that you have turned right ruling into wormwood. Okay? That's not good. So you've lied about my right ruling and you've made it bitter. Okay? So that's why we are receiving all these curses and things because we're not following his, his program. In Revelation 16 it says, And the seventh messenger poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the dwelling place of the heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there came to be noise, noises, and thunders, and lightnings. And there came to be a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake, as had not come, came to be since men were on the earth. Of course, we recently have been hearing about the approaching possible brown dwarf star, which has its own planets coming close to us, even possibly on a trajectory within the orbit of the Earth itself. And tell me if that isn't going to have some serious effects around Yom Teruah, if it is, if it is factual. If another star that's brown, that's a brown dwarf, that's already burned out, that has its own satellites or planets, comes within our solar system, which happens. It happens in the galaxy all the time. But if that thing comes in, it's not going to be easy to see, but it's really going to have a serious effect, because it's like having two suns in the same place, or nearly the same place. Yael 2, or Joel 2, starting in verse 30, says this, And I shall give signs in the heavens, and upon the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun is turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And it shall be that whoever, everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. For on Mount Sion and in Jerusalem there shall be an escape, as Yahuwah has said, and among the survivors whom Yahuwah calls. Now that's uh, also met, uh, repeated at Acts 2, verse 21. And there's other scriptures here that you can read. Now, Psalm 91 gives us consolation because we know his name. A thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it does not come near you. Only with your eyes you look on and see the reward of the wrong ones because you, made, you have made Yahuwah my refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. No evil befalls you and a plague does not come near your tent. For he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You tread upon lion and cobra, young lion and serpent you trample underfoot, because he cleaves to me in love. Therefore I deliver him. I set him on high, because he has known my name. When he calls on me, I answer him. I am with him in distress in the day of tribulation. I deliver him and esteem him. With long life I satisfy him and show him my deliverance, which is the word Yeshua. Now here's a man who was uh, recorded on video, who actually was part of the scientific development of nuclear fission. His name is J. Robert Oppenheimer. And through his tears, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita, not having scripture, he only said, I, I, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. He knew what he had wrought. And he was weeping when you saw that when he, you, this picture, there's tears falling down his face. But he, he's without life, he doesn't have scripture. There was a time when we didn't either. But uh, <clears throat> Revelation 16.1 says, And I heard a loud voice from the dwelling place saying to the seven messengers, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of Elohim on the earth. They should have put this stuff underground, you know, like a mile down. Then it wouldn't have been this problem, you know. Oops. <laughs> what were we thinking? A containment center, yeah. Anyway, here's the, some of the wormwood that we could think of as physical that's been going on since around 1945 to 1950, all the way to the present. Scientists are linking increasing cancers to nuclear pollution 
of our environment. The cancer rate for children ages five to nine was very low before 1945, about one in 10,000. Even in states such as Texas that have high rates of chemical pollution because of the oil and gas industry, the rate has since climbed to 100 in 10,000. That's a hundredfold. Overwhelming evidence of the link between childhood cancer and radiation. Now, considering the spiritual wormwood, Deuteronomy 29 says this, Therefore you shall guard the words of this covenant, and do them, so that you prosper in all that you do. All of you are standing today before Yahuwah your Elohim, your leaders, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and, your, and the sojourner who is in the midst of your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you should enter into covenant with Yahuwah your Elohim, and into his oath, which Yahuwah your Elohim makes with you today, in order to establish you today as a people for himself. And he himself be your Elohim, as he has spoken to you, and as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Yishak, and to Yaakov. Now watch this carefully, because the message of the kingdom is for all who would enter in. Because we continue right along, and it says, And not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands here with us today, before you who are Elohim, as well as with him who is not here with us today. And that would be us, and all of our children and grandchildren and so forth. For you know how we dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim, and how we passed through the nations which you passed through. And you saw their abominations and their idols, wood, stone, silver and gold, which were with them, Christmas trees, bunny rabbits. <laughs> Lest there be some among you, there should be, a, be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart turns away today from Yahuwah our Elohim to go and serve the mighty ones of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. In other words, change, changing his right rulings. So spiritual wormwood is in the heart of a person who is stubborn and rebellious against his words. And you see, we see this in the face of people when we share the truth with them. They're dead. They're completely dead. But we have to plant the seed, you know. Anyway, their hearts are rebellious. The reason for Wormwood is continued here, and it shall be when he hears the words of this curse, that he should bless himself in his heart, saying, oh, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. That's what they say. I've got everything under control here. In order to add drunkenness to thirst, Yahuwah would not forgive him, but rather the displeasure of Yahuwah and his jealousy shall burn against that man. And every curse that is written in this book shall settle on him. And Yahuwah shall blot out his name from under the heavens. And Yahuwah shall separate him for evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all of the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the Torah. In other words, this guy that says, oh, I'm okay, I'll walk in the evilness and the stubbornness of my own heart, that's false security that's encouraged by those who teach against the covenant, both then and now. So if you have a teacher that says, well, we're under grace, or we're under, well, we are, we always have been, but you see, you've got to repent, or you will likewise perish. See, and repentance involves going back to the words, the eternal words that will never pass away. Why is Yahuwah allowing these plagues that are happening today? Well, Deuteronomy 29 brings that out too. And the generation to come of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which Yahuwah has sent into it, all, this, all its land is sulfur, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Amorah, Adma and Seboim, which Yahuwah overthrew in his displeasure and his wrath. And all nations shall say, Why has Yahuwah done so to this land? What, what does the heat of this great displeasure mean? And it shall be said, because they have forsaken the covenant of Yahuwah 
Elohim of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. And you hear teachers today, the great majority, the ones with the great big microphones, saying, we don't have to keep those laws. <laughs> you, hear, you hear it all the time. That is directly against this text. And others, many others. Now, continuing in Deuteronomy 29, and they went and served other mighty ones and bowed themselves to them. Now, we're going to see that in just a few moments. Mighty ones that they did not know and that he had not given to them. Therefore, the displeasure of Yahuwah burned against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And Yahuwah uprooted them from their land in displeasure and in wrath and in great rage and cast them into another land as it is today. The secret matters belong to Yahuwah, our Elohim, but what is revealed belongs to us and to our children forever to do all the words of this Torah. And we have to remember, we're in captivity right now. Luke 21, Yahushua says, And there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and stars, and on the earth, anxiety of nations, in bewilderment at the roaring of the sea, and agitation, men fainting from fear and the expectation of what is coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then they shall see the son of Adam coming in a cloud with power and much esteem. Now, at that time, we don't want to become petrified. Uh, we want to say, well, now wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I'm in a covenant with him, and we have to call on his name at that time. And in fact, do it daily. But, you know, wormwood's venom is a poison, and it's a very bitter pill to swallow. Revelation 18.4 says, And I heard another voice from the heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Now, you see this uh, little statue that we honor in our New York harbor. That's the deity that started in Babylon, and it went into Rome, and it's this name, L-I-B-E-R-T, you know, well, A-S in the Latin. Anyway, it's a Babel's great mother is what it is. It's a sun deity. And, uh, you know, this, this thing's been riding a beast. But uh, we're going to look at that a little bit here in a moment. Uh, Zephaniah 3 is really interesting. Because it, in that text, there's verse 9, which is really key to this. It says, therefore, wait for me declares Yahuwah, until the day I rise up for plunder. For my judgment is to gather nations, to assemble rains, to pour out on them my rage, all my burning wrath. For by the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. For then I shall turn unto the peoples a clean lip, so that they all call on the name of Yahuwah, to serve him with one shoulder. And that word lip refers to their language, a clean language, one that doesn't obfuscate or, or circumambulate around his name, but they use his name. You know. He won't give his name to people that won't repent. You can, you can say their, the name of Yahuwah to them, and they'll say, well, isn't that nice? And then they'll just they'll have it in their head, but then they won't receive it. You know, It'll just pass right by them. Now, ultimate wormwood, what would that possibly be? Well, uh, how about the abomination of desolation? That would be desolation of his covenant. You know? And uh, to des desolate his covenant, he already said, is Wormwood. And, and it is done by the anti-Mashiach, who is also uh, has the title Mystery of Iniquity. And it's also the worship of the beast and his image. And they bow down to the objects that they worship. Okay, they, they, they bow down and kiss the ring and hand of the leaders. They bow to them. They kneel before these men. And even pictures of the men, they all kneel down. Okay? This is the Dalai Lama and the, and the head of another religion over here. Now, watch this. A statue of this man named Buddha, or Sadama, Siddhartha Gautama is his real name. And he's uh, got a little statue of himself. And these Tibetan monks put it over the tabernacle, which is a, like a little Shakabuku Gohanza, 
in every Catholic uh, building. And they uh, have a little gold doors that they open up. Anyway, on top of that, they've placed this. Uh, of course, they've got their little, uh, little cages, too, that they put their donuts in, and there's a statues. But they put this statue of Buddha on top in a Catholic building. There's a picture of it right here. And anyway, on October 27, 1986, with due permission from the Pope, that John Paul II, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhist monks of his sect placed a small statue of Buddha over the tabernacle of St. Peter in, in Assisi. The statue was encased in a glass cylinder as shown below it left. In front of the tabernacle below center was a censer in the shape of a lotus flower and to its left a small banner with Buddhist inscriptions. Two pagan religious books were also placed on either side of the tabernacle along with candles that burned in honor of the idol. And the below right over there we see Buddhist monks adoring the idol and prayed that all may soon attain the state of Buddha. Oh, <laughs> state of Buddha, oh boy. Anyway, there they are. It looked a lot like the Islamic people do, you know, they were bowing down just like that. But Anyway, Revelation 13 says something interesting too. And he leads astray those dwelling on the earth because of those signs which he was given to do before the beast saying to those dwelling on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. Now that can be interpreted in a number of ways but one of those ways would certainly be the signs or the ideas of, of what's happening in salvation because Catholicism for example since the fathers in, at the Catechetical School of Alexandria and subsequently through other councils have developed these sacraments for salvation to receive from the priesthood and of course, uh, they're dressing a lot like the Buddhist monks and the, and the Tibetan monks, you know, with their Nehru collars and this religion from India that went to Rome. But these sacraments, there's supposedly seven of them, and they are, that's the means to salvation. They have to go to the priests in order to receive the endowment of the, whatever the plasma is that they flow from. Anyway, the beast would have to be a government and the government would be the organizational structure of this system. It's an institutionalized false worship is what it really is. And the image would have to also include all the images, but certainly the thing that they adore. And that would be primarily the wafer deity, which is the bread that they hold up in the shape of a sun. It's a little round uh, disc. And uh, they bow down to this and they pray to it. And that would probably be wormwood. False teachings from a cup of abominations. Now here we see people bowing or kneeling before an image of the Roman pontiff. There's just a picture. She's worshiping that. And uh, when they give the host to someone, you know, their little uh, wafer deity, they're kneeling when they receive it. And they, the, the priest says, the, the body of Christ. Well, where is the body of Christ? The body of the Messiah. Well, isn't it us? Yes. If he dwells in us, then, we're, then we are his body. He's the head, and he's Israel, and we are uh, corporately Israel. Now, this is the monstrance that they put the little thing in, and it looks a lot like a sun. It looks just like the Roman deity, you know. Uh, they have a little cross above it, just like cross Constantine uh, had seen in a vision, the sun with a cross you know, in this sign conquer. And of course this, the cross symbol, the Latin word crux, was always the solar symbol. And in the middle of this monstrance, as they call it, uh, they have this bread wafer, the wafer deity, that they kneel before and pray to. And it's designed for worship. <clears throat> now this is a violation of commandment number two. Exodus 20 says, you do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. 
So here we go. We have a family of uh, worshipers of these idols. Now that is wormwood. Okay, that's taking the commandment, altering it, or wiping it out, and changing it. You know, changing the right ruling is, Yahuwah says in Amos, it's wormwood. Revelation 13 says, And the beast I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And those are all parts of the, of the statue shown to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel uh, in his interpretation. Now, and the dragon, the dragon, that's the enemy of Yahuwah and Yahuwah's wife, Israel, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Well, who would that possibly be? Now, interestingly enough, we've got an eagle up here, which is also a, an ancient Persian image of the sun. It went into Egypt and Greece and Rome. And our country has an eagle, too. The identity thief, who is the dragon, he steals the identity of Yahuwah in order to make you think you're worshiping Yahusha, but you're actually worshiping the dragon. Because he wants to be like Yahuwah. And he spreads poison, or wormwood, from the cup of abominations. I just want you all to see all this stuff is uh, lining up with everything you've been trained with. Revelation 17, verse 4 says, And the woman, this is the woman, this mother, C-H-U-R-C-H, was dressed in purple and scarlet, literally, <laughs> and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup filled with abominations. They put the little hosts in this golden cup and show it to everybody and, uh, and while everybody's on their knees. And the filthiness of her whoring, and upon her forehead a name written, a secret. Babel the Great, the mother of the whores and of the abominations of the earth. So uh, Babel was a goal in Jeremiah, or Jeremiah 51, 7, it says Babel was a golden cup in the hand of Yahuwah, making drunk all the earth. The nations drank her wine, and that is why the nations went, went mad. They wouldn't follow him, so he allowed Babel to expand. So Babel is everywhere, but it's got a headquarters, of course. You know. And there was given to him to give spirit to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause to be killed as many as would not worship the image of the beast. When this institution that the Catholics instituted of this being the actual body of the Messiah, that was a death penalty if you did not worship it. So that would be applying to this text too. And he causes all, both small and great, and rich and poor, and free and slave, to be given a mark, a mark, upon their right hand or upon their foreheads, and that no one should be able to buy or sell except he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And, and, and quoting from them, their, uh, their own records here, Sunday is our mark of authority. The, the C-H-U-R-C-H is above the B-I-B-L-E, and this, in other words, they're saying that their organization is above the word of Yahuwah, okay? And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Now, the Constantine's Creed is not well known among most people, but here's some wormwood for you. He required that all these people that were coming into the faith swear this oath. I renounce all customs, rites, legalisms, unleavened breads, and sacrifices of lambs of the Hebrews, and all the other feasts of the Hebrews, sacrifices, prayers, aspirations, purifications, sanctifications, propitiations, and fasts, and new moons, and Sabbaths, and superstitions, and hymns, and chants, and observances, and synagogues. Absolutely everything Jewish, every law, right and custom. And if afterwards I shall wish to deny and return to Jewish superstition, or shall be found eating with the Jews, or feasting with them, or secretly conversing and condemning the Christian religion, instead of openly confuting them and condemning their vain faith, 
Then let the trembling of Cain and the leprosy of Gehazi cleave to me, as well as the legal punishments to which I acknowledge myself liable. And may I ha be an anathema in the world to come, and may my soul be set down with Satan and the devils. What? <laughs> That's the perfect way to get yourself lined up with that, I would think. And there's the quote from the, uh, this man, Stefano Esamani. Yeah. Anyway, it's pretty, pretty messed up. Anyway, the, the followers, all the followers of the Messiah of the Yahudim, if you were a follower and you were a Yahudi, a Jew, and you were a follower of Yahushua HaMashiach, who wished to become a member of the Christian community, they were compelled to adopt the new set of rules and customs. Creeds were drafted to which the new Christian would have to swear. And remember Amos, the prophet, quoting Yahuwah's words, that to change the right ruling is wormwood. Okay? Now, they had to say this, I accept all customs, rites, legalism, and feasts of the Romans, sacrifices, prayers, purifications with water, sanctifications by Pontificus Maximus, or Pontific, Pontificus Maximus, that's what it said, propitiations and feasts, and the new Sabbath, sol dii. The new Sabbath, <laughs> all the day of the sun, all new chants and observances, and all the foods and drinks of the Romans. I absolutely accept everything Roman, every new law, rite, and custom of Rome, and the new Roman religion. In approximately 365, the Council of Laodicea set forth this wormwood. <laughs> Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath. Well, they just acknowledge the Sabbath. What? but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema, that means to be against, from Christ, or take, uh, taken away from him. Now note, Protestants are included as they still observe the holidays and Sabbaths, the Sabbath of Rome, which is Sunday. Also, note that this council claimed the reality of the Sabbath, but prohibited resting on it. Isn't that odd? If only I had a brain. The new laws enacted by Antiochus Epiphanes, here they are. Now that's uh, 186 BCE, that's the one that was the Greek that came into the land of Yehuda and, and, and was setting up and defiling the temple. You shall profane the Sabbath, number one. That's the covenant sign. The dragon would like that, wouldn't he? Now, you shall change the set times or festivals and laws, and you shall set up idols, and you, shall, <laughs> and you shall eat unclean animals, and you shall not circumcise, and you shall forget Torah. Well, see, that's been done. Antiochus Epiphany set up an image of Zeus in the temple, and it's a type of abomination of desolation, spoken of in Daniel 11, and for three years he continued to profane the temple. Constantine would later repeat this pattern, and this has been passed down through the various denominations of Christianity, all being daughters of the Catholic Universal Circus. Anyway, at the United Nations, we had a picture there of this deity, Zeus, and there you know people honor that. The Temple of Yahuwah is not a building, okay? Yahushua's body is his temple, and it's Yisrael, his covenant people and all who engraft into that body. The, re the restored tribes are coming into that. But uh, we haven't been properly instructed. We've been drinking wormwood. He has put his name and his Torah into us. His name and his Torah, which is what Nazarim preserve and defend. That's what we're guardians of. That's why the word Nazarim means guardians, watchmen. You know. Now, he's going to gather us from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be put to shame for any of your deeds in which you have transgressed against me. For then I shall remove from your midst your proud exulting ones, and you shall no more be haughty in my set-apart mountain. But I shall leave in your midst an oppressed and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of Yahuwah. The remnant of Yisrael shall do no more unrighteousness and speak no falsehood, nor is a tongue of deceit found in their mouth. 
for they shall feed their flocks and lie down with none to frighten them. So when he gathers us to the land, we're not going to be lying down frightened and hearing bombs. You know, shout for joy, O daughter of Sion, shout, O Yisrael, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Yerushalayim. Yahuwah has turned aside your judgments, and he has faced your enemy. The sovereign of Yisrael, Yahuwah, is in your midst. So we don't have to worry about uh, Islamic people or angry people coming after us, crusaders or the dragon, you know. No longer need you fear evil. In that day it shall be said to Yerushalayim, do not fear Sion, do not let your hands be weak. Yahuwah your Elohim is in your midst, is mighty to save. He rejoices over you with joy. He is silent in his love. He rejoices over you with singing. So he's going to sing. You know, that's going to be a day. We sing to him, but wow. I shall gather those who grieve about the appointed place, who are among, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. See, I am dealing with all those afflicting you at that time, and I shall save the lame and gather those who were cast out, and I shall give them for a praise and for a name in all the earth where they were put to shame. And at, at that time I shall bring you in, even at the time I gather you. For I shall give you for a name and for a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, said Yahuwah. Isaiah, or Yeshayahu 48, says, Thus said Yahuwah, your Redeemer, the set-apart one of Yisrael. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, teaching you what is best, leading you by the way you should go, if only you had listened to my commands. Then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. And in 49, he says, All flesh shall know that I, Yahuwah, am your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Elohim of Yaakov. And that's uh, going to be who he is. He's, when he comes, that's who he is. And our commission was given to us to preserve the name and the Torah, our order to teach the righteousness of Yahuwah to the nations. And Yahushua said in his departing words, Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit in the name, and teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. So we don't have to worry when we see the earth's crust buckling and huge things happening and things falling. Uh, you know, we've been, if we're found doing what we're supposed to be doing, teaching the household of faith and teaching the nations the name and the Torah of Yahuwah, then he's going to give us protection. He's promised this, you know. So we just have to keep the covenant burning in our heart. The, the, two, the two resurrections lecture or seminar would clearly explain why it's two resurrections. There's one a thousand years apart. And the wise virgins are the ones that have the oil or the mind of the spirit, the mind of the spirit of Yahuwah in them to keep the covenant. And they'll be working during that thousand years to teach the nations that survive, you know. So that's all I have today. Is there any comments or questions or related topics? Yes, sir? Uh, when you were talking about concepts, uh, recently I watched a documentary and did a little research, and I don't know if anybody else was aware of it, I'm sure it wasn't, but after Mark Cohen died, and uh, he was the one that said, well, I'm not going to get involved in this Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just that they, the Christians were told not to stay around. They went out and actually just slaughtered these people and just wiped them out of the lot of Europe. Well, that same, that same spirit that was in Antiochus Epiphanes and Constantine and others, uh, Nero, uh, there were several other Roman Caesars, but also in Hitler, you know, and in the Crusaders. They were going around burning and pillaging, uh, you know, and, the, and just in this last hundred years or so, there were pogroms in Russia, and a lot of the people that came here from Russia had escaped those pogroms, 
they were killing people and burning their stores and you know and in Spain it's been happening all through time it's never stopped the dragon has pursued the woman you know poured out of its mouth a flood of persecution and uh, that's mentioned in Revelation so we have the dragon pursuing the woman the wife of Yahuwah the ones keeping the commandments of Elohim and holding to the testimony of Yahusha you know but it's never stopped. You're absolutely right about Constantine, though. But that same spirit is the dragon, and it's institutionalized, and it has become institutionalized in various places. Any other comments? Uh, or Yes? In the Inquisition, the Catholic Church, you know, all the people in Spain and Mexico to say, okay, we're Catholic. Then they would kill them so they couldn't repent of that. Wow. Isn't that something? You know, it's interesting. We think that in the ancient world there wasn't a respect for human life. And according to what we've heard from history, that's probably pretty much true by the rulers. The rulers held life and death in their hand, and they just killed people wholesale. Uh, like we see happening in Libya right now. I mean, he's attacking his own population, massacring them. Of course, we know that they're really fighting a swarm of Al-Qaeda is what they're really doing, bouncing from country to country. These people that are called rebels are really Al-Qaeda. They've just left the two battlefields and come over to these other Arab countries. But, and now we're helping them, you know. Well, the CIA invented Al-Qaeda. But anyway, the thing of it is, um, when we think of human life, you, you remember Yonah when he got on the ship at, at Yapa and he was headed for Tarshish and the storm started to blow and the men on the ship were casting everything off the ship that they could that was not, you know, people and uh, basically trying to think of anything they could to because they knew this was a supernatural storm, it wasn't normal and uh, Yonah said, well, throw me overboard. And they didn't want to because they respected human life, even these pagans, you know. So they didn't want to harm Yonah unless it was absolutely necessary. But, you know, basically at, when push came to shove, they actually did have to do it, you know. And uh, then the storm instantly ceased, like, and the sky was blue. <laughs> it's amazing. And, uh, but anyway, the thing of it is, uh, one life was offered for the sake of the crew, but uh, these men didn't want to do this. This was the last resort for them. They, I mean, if, we, if they didn't respect human life, they'd just say, oh yeah, sure, let's try anything. They, they resisted, you know. Gaddafi uh, is also a Jewish. Both of his parents really? were Jewish. Just a type of a search engine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's really not who they think they are. I mean, uh -huh. same thing with Arkham Duke. Yeah. Supposedly, uh, they always said they want to mm -hmm. kill the great Satan. Well, the, the tribes of Israel have obviously been merged with all the nations. So we have all the tribes, you know. We're fixed on Jews or Yahudi, Yahudim pretty much, but where's Reuben, you know, and Naphtali and Zebulon, and uh, you know, Yosef, you know we have become the nations that's who the nations are, you know, so the seed is evenly dispersed like Amos 9 verse 9 says you know, he sifted us among the nations, like a, in a sieve, you know so, you know, any other comments? Well, Esau, Esau's tribe married I think that he was married to uh, Edomites. Uh, well, uh, he was Edom, yes. but uh, he was married to, uh, yeah, he was married to all these Ishmaelites. Yeah, he was married to them. So that's where you see a lot of this coming from. Yeah. So, well, that's true, but, you know, even so. Even so. Yeah. What about this gentleman that's built up burning this Quran down there? Oh, they do that to Yahuwah's word all the time in their faith. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's not a problem. In fact, you, if you're found with a copy of it, you're arrested. You know, what do you think they do with it? I think I hear that they use uh, use it for uh, for toilet paper. You know, I've heard all kinds of things, and they don't have any problem uh, we don't de hear about that defiling. We just hear about yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's odd. Yes, sir. Have any of you seen the Andrew Bay video where it talks about the law of the land? More or less what we're doing in South Africa right now. If uh, you determine you have a need, and Leroy's got something that I need, I can take it. Well, look on the U.S. Department of Justice website to have it done. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in Yahoo's world, it was uh, back in the day. It was uh, set up for the people who were who were fatherless and unable to support themselves. And then they, when they got older, they wouldn't stay on the welfare program of the of the of the tithe. They would, of course, reach maturity and they would get a job. You know, that's the way the plan is. And of course, if a person was incapacitated and uh, or in temporary need, like for example, a foreigner who was fleeing a war they were given help, you know, sustenance. Uh, but it wasn't like this is a permanent life, lifelong thing, you know. Our program is really quite wrong, you know. You know, we need to go out there and reinvent ourselves, re-educate re ourselves, whatever we have to do. Uh, take a lower position if we have to. You know, if we're making uh, uh, 50000 a year and we lose that job, then we have to take something that makes 10000 a year, possibly, but just get out there and work. You might even work harder. It's easy to work harder making less money. So, uh, but what about uh, any other comments that you want to bring up real quick? Because I'm going to have to depart. Well, thank you. Warm wood. Warm wood. Warm wood. Warm wood.